Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Eastern Historical Society. As part of our continuing uh, series on uh, local authors, uh, we have today with us uh, James Thompson, who is an OA graduate back, what? 50 did you, years ago. 50 years ago. Uh, but um, uh, he's uh, seen a lot of, uh, of activity and living down in Plymouth right now. And he is going to be giving us a uh, presentation on Boston Light, something that's really fascinating. It's uh, the oldest lighthouse in uh, the United States? Well, it's the oldest lighthouse station. We'll get into that. All <laughs> right. Very good. So without further ado, here you go. Hi. Um, I get it. My wife is usually around to rein me in, so I had to bring this today. To... <laughs> we do a good presentation together, but she's uh, out taking a yoga course in Millis right now. So without further ado, we'll get into the PowerPoint presentation, and we try to take and twitch them around a little bit. But uh, in uh, 2016, we had a 300th anniversary out at Boston Light. And next year, we're going to have another 300th anniversary because part of our uh, activity as a light station, we're also a fog signal station. And in 1719, three years into the lighthouse, we were already into our third keeper, the first two having drowned. And all the early keepers were harbor pilots. And what they would do in the fog is they'd fire off a small cannon. So he asked for and received a cannon. So that's sunrise. There's an aerial view. And as you can see, our newest building on the island is 1899. How many of you are into great New England storms? The Portland Gale of 1898. I One of the casualties the was the boathouse. And as you look in the background, there's uh, Deer Island in Winthrop in the background. To the very far left, you can just pick out the uh, digesters out on Deer Island, so we have nice, clear water now. And to give you an orientation, um, this is a map of the Boston Harbors. And those in green are part of the uh, Boston Harbor National and State Parks. There's 27 islands and peninsulas, of which Boston Light is circled in blue. Now, between 1880 and 1900, um, the captains didn't like going through this area between Georgia's Lovells and Gallops. It's called the Narrows. And as they started building the ships bigger and faster, they complained. So during that time, they dredged and blasted the North and South Channels. And thus, we had a need for a Graves Light, which is circled in red. There's one other lighthouse in the area, the one circled in brown, and that is now owned by the, when the National Park established itself, it owned no property. Um, but when the Coast Guard accessed Deer Island Light, the National Park now owns it, something like six hundredths of an acre. There's another aerial view. OK. Uh, this one I, I get a kick out of because I don't think there were any trees after about uh, 1690. There was actually a report I was reading where if the owners didn't take the trees down, somebody could get a permit to take the trees down. So, so Easton's tie-in with Boston Light starts in 1775. At the time, he didn't live here. But uh, he married an Eastern girl and spent about 10 years here. And he was actually teaching school in the wintertime. He led an attack on Boston Light. And 
This is right out of Chafin's history. And so the last thing that they did when the British were embarrassed into uh, leaving Boston Harbor because uh, Mr. Knox and his crew dragged those cannons from Fort Ticonderoga and they set them up on Dorchester Heights, is they set a keg of powder and blew up the tower. Now somebody was, Ed, you were introducing as the oldest lighthouse. Well, we have to be a little careful with that because those folks down in New Jersey like to claim the oldest lighthouse. This tower dates from 1764, as most of it dates from 1783. Same year we signed the treaty making it economic to put it back up. And now we've got some actual photographs. This one shows the uh, duplex that was built in 1859, and it actually was connected to the tower. Now in identifying Boston Light, there's, you look for five, or in this case, six rings, because I think it was about 1820, the tower started having that middle-aged spread that some of us are dealing with, and so they put uh, six iron bands around it, and uh, they removed one of the bands in a later time, and the reason they removed it is it was right where the gable was right in that location. So I think they had a lot of leak problems. So this is when we had our work done for our 300th anniversary. Um, I could spend a half hour just talking about this, but one of the interesting things when they redid the roof, they pulled off one of the planks because it was rotting, they poked their head in, and there's a part of the lower band is still in the tower. This one we love because it's traditionally the island, the light tower is stuccoed. One of the things they did was they repointed it and they expected to go in an inch or two. Many times they were going in the entire length. And when they took the stucco off the bottom, it became very apparent that we have the oldest lighthouse base. This you can see by the rubble stone versus the more finished stone that the bottom uh, seven to 10 feet is the original tower. It's 10 feet thick at the top, at the base of it, so uh, even that keg of powder didn't take all of it out. This is the oldest uh, photographs we have. My wife loves this one um, because the house that we live in now was built in 1884 and sits right here. These pictures were donated to the keeper by Lynn Jewell Holbrook. Uh, and uh, that Holbrook is the same clan as uh, Hal Holbrook. The house that you saw before, this was a remodeling that was done in 1895. The keepers kept having kids, so they expanded the, the roof to take and hold them. At one time, there was a keeper and his family, a first assistant keeper, second assistant keeper, so there were three keepers, their wives, and 18 kids on a two-acre island. This, this picture we love, um, it shows how the government kept tabs. You can actually see these are the oil drums and they're padlocked. This was a connector that ran to the house that was built in 1859, and there's the chimneys and wicking that they had. This is a more recent picture. This is the second order Fresnel lens. Uh, those are 1,000 watt halogen lamps. Um, they're just getting ready to replace them with a, the next version. They had, for a short time, they had a smaller bulb that would fit into this bipost. And uh, the last time I was out there last Tuesday, uh, the light went out and it turned out because we had a power loss and they had to push the little tiny button to restart it. But they don't make these bulbs anymore, so we've got a new bulb that's like a ratchet that a Canon would have, a Canon camera, I should say. So prior to electricity, the last thing we had was an incandescent oil vapor lamp, think Coleman camping lantern, except the wick 
It was about four inches tall, and you actually had a hand pump where you pumped it up. It was nice and bright, and it kept the keeper up there because he had to go up every four hours to pump it up. But we eventually went to electricity. They uh, brought a gas-powered generator out, and now we have a 13,000-foot extension cord, <laughs> which needs to be replaced. These are just some other ones. It's interesting, uh, at this time, uh, in the 50s, they were actually keeping the oil out here, and you can just about see this ramp. The ramp got taken out in last year's storm, so it's a good thing they didn't do that anymore. These are a couple. The one on the left is a picture from the tower looking at showing. We typically have a north and south pier, and this was a, a little one lung of gasoline engine that was used to haul the boat into the boathouse. There's a, a picture you can see. Uh, at that time, that was Point Allerton's boat that was coming in, and you had a protected wharf on either side to find some calm water. This is 1950, and most of the pictures were taken after storms. You can see the damage on the North Pier that was built in the 30s. One thing I love on this is there's the duplex outhouse that went with the duplex. There's something different in this picture. This was taken in 1960, and they decided to take the families off, turned it into the terminology was stag station. So they had a 100-year-old house that was rat infested and falling apart, so they burned it on my birthday. And we're still fighting storm damage. This uh, pier that you see on the right was put in after the blizzard of 78. It was 1984 when they got it finished. And the one on the left you can see is getting in worse and worse shape. We've got written record of a north and a south pier going back to the middle of the 19th century, and I think it went back much further. Um, this was our ramp, and it's supposed to be lined up over here. So uh, we didn't have any tours last year. One of the things I get to do every year is shovel rocks. There were a lot this year. We didn't get them all shoveled back. I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. We have our own wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and this is it. That rubber cover was pulled off by the storm and uh, took us most of the summer to get it back up and operating the way it wants to be. You can actually see the stones get washed up. That's probably about 10 feet above your normal high water. There's the work cleaning. At Blizzard of 78, the assistant keepers told us it was about waist deep at that low point. And the garden got pickled again, washed. You can, if you look closely, you can see it washed a lot of the loam and stuff off. Sally made the big decision and made it a little bit smaller. It washed away, undermining one of the steps. And these are gabions that they put in originally in 78, and I think this batch was put in around 2010 or thereabouts, um, and they just got torn all over the place. That was January and then March. This picture I love. Sally really looks, this picture's a few years old, but that's what she looks like in the beginning of the season. That's her 20-foot her uh, center console, call the SBLS. Usually operates as the 292. Um, and there we are, as we would approach the pier now, but it's too cold, so the Coast Guard actually takes us back and forth. 
and I can tell that's the beginning of the season because the boat is nice and clean. Looks pretty grubby by the end of the year. We made some temporary repairs just so that we could use the ramp instead of going around in the rubble. And that's Jim Healy. Any of you familiar with Duck Tours in Boston? He's one of the four originators. And I asked him, I saw the picture with the Red Sox, and I said, how many ducks did you have? He said, we had 25, because I saw one of the pictures and it just went on. But their, their ducks are not the original World War II ducks. They're all modified, so they're a whole lot safer. You can see we've, we've made some strides on the walkway. There's the wastewater treatment plant uncovered. And you can see we, we keep picking away. Every time you go out, you throw a few rocks. And this is one of the things that uh, the keeper's job description didn't particularly mention. Uh, Sally's the in charge of keeping the wastewater treatment plant in tune. And uh, we have to look out for the rocks when we're mowing. And we have a few foggy days. And there's Sally on Clyde Light. Um, it's, it's really, it's one thing to mow a lawn, it's another thing to mow a lawn that's up and down and loaded with rocks. So, so there's yours truly. Yeah. This is, this is my, my t-shirt, says Keeper's Husband. It keeps me, <laughs> it keeps me in place, but when we're giving tours, I wear a, a blouse over that and I peel it back and I suck people into history because there never were very many keepers' husbands because usually it was a, a widow or a daughter that knew how to tend the light and they were able to get the job, so. That's is how everything gets in and out, including our five-gallon Simpson Spring water jugs. <laughs> we have certification that the water is totally un usable, we're not even supposed to wash our hands in it. You can see we've been making headway. We have our own spices. That is a night heron. You're always close to nature out there. And what do you do as an assistant keeper? Work, work, work. You can see the gardens coming along. We always have interesting weather out there. And you never know what's coming. This boat pulled up and there was a swimmer with it. And this is uh, Mike McDivitt of a Kushnet Towing and he came out with the dock. This 10 by 50 foot dock is attached to those guide piles and that provides limited public access. It is a major job putting it up. And uh, that's what we experience after the next tide. Uh, we put new rubbers on it and the guide piles were rough enough that it didn't slide up and down. Uh, typical government surplus, that's an old World War II boat that's his pride and joy. <laughs> and more surplus, that's I think, Sally said it was about a 1990. Everything takes longer on an island. We had an inspection on the wastewater treatment plant, and it's required somebody has to come out monthly to take and do that during season. And as I say, it got pickled by the, the salt air, so we had to take and put sugar in it every day to try to get the guys to grow well enough. And by the end of the season, it was working pretty well. This is the fog signal building, and Sally's task this year was to scrape and paint the floor so we could 
move the fog signal cannon. But every once in a while I have to take a break and enjoy the view. This is the same shot as before when you saw the fuel tanks. It was turned into a museum room in the 60s and that is a uh, fifth order Fresnel lens that's in there. Um, and then there's a uh, acetylene filament for the old acetylene buoy and we were actually we took some of the stuff out because it was a, it was just overloaded with stuff and one of the items interested me and it was mislabeled and I uh, called Tom Tagg who's an expert on lighthouse things and my the description didn't help but when I sent a picture of it he said oh that's a sun sun lamp and what it did is it turned the buoys on and off automatically as the sun went down. There's more digging and work. We're getting the floor ready and you always have to take a break. And this is the repair to the porch with the uh, walkway and I say it's always a big big deal trying to take and move stuff around. And that was just so they could tow the trailer with the supplies. Taking the old fuel line off. They decided it was easier to take and strip the shingles off to a certain level and, and redo the whole side rather than trying to patch it. That's how you go back and forth to work. It was actually was worth the Coast Guard paying to take and put the uh, floating dock in because otherwise it would have limited the access for the work as it, we had tied dependent without that float. They're coming along, putting a new railing on. This was, you know, we never get contacted when things are going. The Coast Guard, that rusty thing that's on there, is a mooring buoy. And when the Coast Guard comes to the island, they tie their big boats up on it. And this is the uh, Coast Guard cutter. I don't think, I think it's the Marcus Hanna. Um, but they arrived, and within an hour, they had the whole job done. Our neighbors are the Wallers out at Graves Light. They're great neighbors. Um, Dave knew that we were interested in trying to move the cannon from the museum room into the fog signal. So he called up and says, what are you doing on Saturday? So that Saturday we got a gang together. And Dave, not only did he buy the lighthouse, but he bought an old 25-foot Coast Guard boat that's Sally's boat, and that's Jim Healy, the duck tour guy, was part of the gang that came out. This is actually an Eastern resident. This is my older brother. Uh, I don't think that's a moxie shirt, but it's almost the right color. Um, and we, uh, we moved the cannon. Uh, the biggest thing was that carriage that it was sitting on, trying to figure out how to get that out the door. And it was like a jigsaw puzzle. We were man able to take the wheels off of it and turn it around, and we got it outside. And there's my brother with a similar hairdo. This made me appreciate what Knox and his gang did, moving those cannons from Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, absolutely amazing. And it just took a lot of patience and doing it right. And there we are with the job done. And then it have to bring the stuff back off. And here's just some pictures. And this was how our season ended. So we were up by the tower and Sally said, what is that stench? So that's what it was. Because uh, we call the uh, aquarium and the next thing we knew they, they put the blur about and some of you probably saw on the TV they had a nice shot flying around the tower with it there. 
So the, they came down and checked it out. Always nice at night. And it moved around and it went from up in the area north of the tower in here and it washed down right in front of the boat house, or in front of the keeper's house. So typically, this boat is part of the um, UMass Boston Marine. It's the Columbia Point. And this year, because we couldn't have uh, tours on the island, they did uh, lighthouse tours. And they came close by. There's Jim Healy. And that's, that's the uniform we normally wear. That's, we call them our ODUs, our work uniform. And we work in conjunction with the Park Service. There's Sally and I waving to the tour boat. And this is our neighbor that was helping us with the cannon. He actually went on and did a, a tour, um, narrated tour on the tour boat. And Sally thought she was going to have a temporary job when she went on, and now she's been 15 years, and I don't think she's going to catch up on those four keepers that had a longer tenure than her. All right. Any questions? I'm going to be around for a while. When you know that a big storm's coming in, and you certainly had some in this past year in January and March, do you tough it out and just hunt it down, or do you ever leave? We'd love to, but we work for the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard has a risk assessment program. Before they go out on a rescue vessel, you have to do a risk assessment on the boat. And if the risk is too high, you don't take that facility out. And so for us, um, they don't let us out there if there's any possibility that we get trapped out there. Because Sally shot herself in the foot, foot. She was out in 2005 when we had our three foot of snow in Plymouth. She had 17 foot waves coming in at the island and she was just running from window to window. Oh, look at this one, look at that one. <laughs> so we got some great storm shots and as soon as they saw them, they said, what were you doing out there? <laughs> yes? I was looking at the glass around the, the lamp house up there, you know, with, with the, the soft spray and the weather and the sea and stuff. How often is that glass did you read? Uh, Replace not that often. Yeah. The biggest issue is, I think back in the early 90s, we had some of the other assistant keepers that were volunteering out there, and uh, the, some birds flew in and, and broke. That's quarter inch plate glass. Yeah. Uh, so that was the biggest. Um, you can actually see there's hand holes where at one time the keepers were request required to take and clean the ice and snow off the glass, but with the risk assessment, that's gone out the window. Did yes? Edward, Edward Rose Snow, visit, well, he must have visited a light on Edward Rose Snow. Edward Rose Snow was a royal pain at times, <laughs> <laughs> because he would visit unannounced. But one of the pictures that uh, Jeremy Dietremont gave to us is there was a girl came out, and it was her 17th birthday. And he got a picture of her in the lens and back at that time, the lamps were the big mogul base, monstrous bulbs. We've got one in the museum room. I'd never seen the apparatus in the light. Because he was a flag Santa Claus. He used to go on all the lights. Yeah. Um, in fact, if I wasn't here today, I would be at the station because Flying Santa is visiting the station today. And that's a, that's a whole other story in itself. So you said the lighthouse uh, used for fog signal. Yes. Means what? It doesn't work. Or it, doesn't, well, it is not on all the time. The well, when we started tending the light back in '94, uh, when the active duty was still there, and there were three people stationed there. There was the keeper and it's two assistant keepers, and with three of them stationed there for the rotation, if somebody wanted to take their vacation leave, got sick, or do training, they'd have to get a replacement body. And it didn't take the Coast Guard too long to realize that, OK, we can, we can take and, and use the freebies, the auxiliaries. 
And you so which light tells in Boston Harbor are used for navigational signal? There, all of the light question is which lighthouses are used for navigation. All of the lighthouses are used for navigation. When Boston Light was put up, it was the only one around, so it just had one solid light. Now it has a, a frequent, it flashes once every 10 seconds, and Gray's Light has a group flashing every 20, so every light has its own characteristic. In fact, uh, Minot's Ledge Light, they just so happened in the late part of the 19th century to put a flash so it flashes once. Then it flashes four times, then it flashes three times. Well, a Coast Guard would love to replace that with something simpler, but it's become known as the I Love You Lighthouse, and they've just given up on trying to change it. Uh, it said if, uh, if a vessel sees your lighthouse, what the vessel will know? He, he's got, you, you need not only to see the lighthouse, but you have to have the navigation tools, the charts, which we have one there. Yes. And there's actually a light list which gives you more information on the flash characteristics, the height of the tower, and all of that stuff. Um, so you've, you've got to take and have some seaman's knowledge, right. but it certainly helps to take and have that physical structure there. In other words, your lighthouse is still important for any vessel approaching from Ocean to Boston Harbor. That's true. When when Gray's light went into operation, it had a first a bigger light, first order lens. Um, it's now much much reduced in power to ours, um, but it's it's still an active aid to navigation. So you also mentioned about 1,000 watts halogen lamp. So what lamp is now in use at this? We, we, this it's automated now, so that lamp stays on 24-7. If something happens, we have a couple of backup lights that give that same 10-second flash characteristic, but in a much reduced power. But it is the lens, which is... The, the lens, the lens I could talk for a half... And visible from a distance. Not yeah, that, that lens is a second-order Fresnel lens with a 1,000... Watt halogen lamp. It's rated for 27 miles. 27 miles. But that is a characteristic of the height of the mariner's eye and the height of the tower. Sally, when she was an Alpha Flying Santa, was out over Worcester and asked the pilot, Is that what I think it is? So she was seeing it from 40 miles away. Wow. And which particular lighthouse in New Jersey folks claim as the oldest? Which one? Cape May or the. Yeah, they, um, Cape May, New Jersey, their tower stands from uh, 1764. But we have the oldest base. Yeah, and what was the age of the base? The age of the base it w went into operation in 1716. It was interesting. The need study was in 1713. They did the funding in 1715, and it was up in operation in 17. 16. Just the way things work today, right? <laughs> and one more question. So if you, if, you, if you install a very deep tube well there, tube well, you, you even do not get fresh water? From yeah, the, the question is well water. They, they attempted drilling uh, waters uh, before, and all they came up with was brackish water. And this was in the latter part of the 19th century. So. So, for your fish, so, it has to be imported right. from the mainland. Yeah, uh, a potable water is, is brought in from the mainland. We use cistern water for uh, flushing the toilets and stuff. And how about taking a shower? What kind of water? Are you we're doing? technically not, sp we got our latest uh, condemned water sauce, and we're not even supposed to wash our hands in it. So, <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> How often you you commute from the mainland to the lighthouse? Uh, it depends. Um, basically, when you need supplies, you have to go ashore. My wife is the only one that's paid. The rest of us are all volunteers. So uh, we try to take and change on Wednesdays or Sundays, but we prove to be quite flexible trying to take and keep it manned. What is your nearest point? The nearest point is Point Allerton. 
uh, which is a mile away, but the Coast Guard station is three miles away, and when we take our boat, it's about six miles. So you have to, you have to come your six miles in water to get to the main. Yeah, so and unless you can afford a helicopter. What is the main talk of which, which, which place? Which town we go? Uh, Hull, the town of Hull is the closest. Oh, the Hull, is yeah, the After, afterwards I can show you on the chart where, where it lies. Okay? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.